heard me two years ago, I you know gave my uh, interim report at, at that time, and so we've we've had a few more discoveries, and I, I hope to bring you up to date. Um, so. Um, this is a, my topic, uh, disaster resilience uh, in the context of aging. I'll begin with a you know, quick um, summarize facts about previous research on disaster. Uh, there, there are tons of uh, studies on the mental health sequelae of disaster. If you do disaster, uh, you know, key, keyword search on disaster in PubMed, you'll see hundreds of papers on PTSD and depression. Um, but um, I'm going to uh, point out that very few have um, focused particularly on the effects of disaster in aging populations, which seems, strikes me as a little bit strange because uh, every, everybody in the world is aging uh, and um, the main uh, victims of natural disaster tend to be, are getting older and older. Um, in the uh, Tohoku earthquake that I'm going to describe, Two thirds of the victims were over the age of 65. And in that population, uh, PTSD is not the main issue as we have discovered. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, this is, in case I run, run out of time, this is my conclusion slide. Um, so the two things I want to leave you with today is that the most prominent long-term health effects in all the populations turns out not to be uh, the mental side. Um, you know, we, as we expected, about 11% of the population in our um, study do have PTSD symptoms, which is about what we expected, but um, it is not the main thing that people complain about. Uh, and even depression, people have uh, by and large recovered from depression about you know, two to three years after the disaster. What really has um, stood out for us is uh, a, a, a remarkable increase in dementia <clears throat> and a massive increase in obesity and the metabolic syndrome. So I'm going to tell you about that in, uh, in the course of the seminar. Um, the other uh, thing we have discovered is that the most important factor in recovery, um, disaster resilience, is not um, the availability of material resources. Uh, it's not about you know, being well prepared with stocks of medical supplies, food and water. Um, it is the invisible stuff, uh, such as the social connections in a community that uh, help people to recover. We call that social capital. So that's what we're going to talk about. My uh, project is called the Iwanuma Project, named after the city in which it is located. Um, the population uh, of the uh, city is 44,000 people. Uh, and um, the facts uh, that 180 residents lost their lives, uh, roughly 6,700 uh, 6, uh, had their homes destroyed and were evacuated to temporary shelters. Uh, and um, we had the, um, we had the by, by, by pure coincidence, uh, seven months before the disaster, we uh, happened to uh, have taken a complete census of all of the older residents in this city. Um, we had established the baseline uh, for a nationwide cohort of healthy aging, actually. And uh, we, we measured everything about these people, their lifestyles, their health status, their community, social capital, etc. And then seven months after we established the baseline, the tsunami struck. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, we had this, therefore, unusual situation of a cohort where uh, we have information about everybody before disaster struck, and then we are able to follow them afterwards to see what predicts um, uh, health outcomes when people are exposed to a major event like this. Um, so with uh, NIH funding, we went back to the community two and a half years after the great earthquake, uh, and we managed to contact pretty much everybody in this um, uh, in the original cohort because uh, Japan has a compulsory residential registration system where by law you're required to notify local authorities every time you move house. And, um, and that enabled us to uh, find everybody um, except for 17 people. That's why that's the 0.3% that's missing. We don't know where they went to. They, they didn't pass away, um, but they moved somewhere that we can't find them. But pretty good. I think you'd agree. 
So um, this is the uh, Iwanuma uh, project. Um, the, 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 it is a sub-study of this nationwide cohort, as I said. Uh, my collaborators and I established this in 2010, seven months before the disaster, with field sites ranging from the northern islands of, of Hokkaido to all over Honshu, Kyushu, and even Okinawa. Uh, and just by chance, one of the field sites uh, highlighted in yellow uh, happened to be 80 kilometers to the west of the epicenter uh, on the day of the earthquake. And um, <clears throat> strangely enough, uh, I, I, was, I had a ticket to uh, fly to Japan on March 11, actually, because I was supposed to meet my uh, you know, research collaborators. And of course, when I woke up in the morning, um, because of the time difference, the tsunami had already happened. So my ticket was canceled and um, my flight was canceled. And we had the surreal uh, situation of, um, of the earthquake happening. And then the uh, meteorological office warning everybody that the tsunami was coming. So people on, on the ground had about an hour to evacuate. And uh, in a almost surreal uh, scenario, uh, the local news media had sufficient time to launch the television helicopters into the air. And um, we could see in real time um, our field site being swallowed by the three waves of the uh, tsunami. So the, the, the town was, uh, was directly impacted uh, and um, my first thought when, uh, when I was watching this and my flight was canceled is that uh, my, there, there goes my study. You know, this is the end of it. You know. Right, but then, <laughs> right, then, yes, but then, uh, then I thought, thought about it for a moment and uh, realized that um, there, there's been no, actually there's been very few studies of disaster recovery where we have information, complete information on people before an event like this happened. Uh, if you you know, you can understand most disaster studies uh, uh, conducted after disaster happens, people go and find the survivors. And so if they notice that uh, there's some prominent health problems in that population, we can't, there's no way of knowing whether the, the people had these problems predating the disaster. Um, you can ask, you know, disaster survivors about what were conditions like, you know, before the disaster, but we know that that's colored by recall bias. So we have, this you know, rather unusual um, setup. And that, that led me to uh, think, think um, again about what we could um, uh, recover from, from uh, the study that was, uh, study site that was directly uh, affected. <clears throat> so you know, two days after the um, earthquake, the planes were flying again. And I really, you know, I thought about whether I should really go or not. And then uh, when I called my collaborators, they said, oh yes, it's okay, you know, we're, we're back online again, please come. So I flew to Tokyo and then uh, the morning after I arrived, I was from jet lag, it was you know, five o'clock in the morning, I turned on the news, news uh, uh, for that morning and uh, the first thing that was on the news was the explosion of the Fukushima nuclear <laughs> 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 you know? And uh, I really thought, that was uh, one, one time I thought I was never gonna come back to America, you know, because uh, it just got worse and worse throughout the whole week. However, um, this, uh, what I'm going to show you is um, uh, not, uh, Iwanuma was not affected by the radiation. It's several hundred kilometers to the north of Fukushima. So what, what I'm going to tell you is mainly the disaster effect of tsunami as well as the shaking impact. This is what the population um, looked like before the disaster. The blue circles represent where the people in our study were living um, seven months before the event. The blue in the right-hand side is the Pacific Ocean, uh, and the um, dark blue circles are the study respondents. Uh, and um, the thin red line shows the extent of tsunami uh, penetration. And thus we have uh, you know, what, uh, for want of a better word, we call a natural experiment, because um, some people were affected, the houses were destroyed or damaged by tsunami, other people were relatively spared, and we have information before the disaster and afterwards. So it's, it's like an experimental setup of a treatment and control group before and after. So um, let's go through the, uh, the conclusions I told you about. The most uh, prominent thing we have discovered is cognitive decline and metabolic syndrome. 
um, and it is not PTSD or depression. Indeed, um, in one of the early studies we published uh, from my postdoc, um, Tsuboya, uh, we, we showed that uh, two and a half years after a disaster, um, tragic um, events like um, have experiencing the loss of relatives and friends is not associated with depression three years later. People had, uh, people reported this history, but there's no correlation with depressive symptoms. They had recovered. On the other hand, um, if they had lost their homes, uh, the continuing uh, economic uncertainty associated with um, you know, a lot major loss of wealth was correlated with depression. So the, 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 the material side seems to affect people's mental symptoms more than the um, psychosocial loss of um, close friends and relatives. But depre you know, so depression is there, but it isn't um, the major thing that people complain about. However, the one thing that uh, uh, the uh, local um, you know, nursing, uh, nurse, nurses, nurse practitioners, and physicians were telling us about was that there's been a marked increase in cognitive disability. And this is the PNAS paper that another one of my postdoctoral fellows, Hikichi, published. This guy uh, has done a lot of the studies I want to tell you about today. Uh, and um, uh, it is an example of an age, uh, aging related outcome, which seems to be connected to uh, disaster experience. As far as I know, very few other people have, have, uh, have reported this. So we, we were able to um, discover this because um, we're taking advantage of having information before as well as after. Uh, Japan has a compulsory um, uh, registration system for eligibility for long-term care, which means that everyone must be uh, examined uh, for signs and symptoms of cognitive disability. Uh, they send uh, people into people's homes uh, and um, they conduct an in-home investigation. And there's like you know, cognitive testing by trained um, uh, personnel using a standardized pr protocol. Um, it's not you know, as detailed as a proper neuropsychiatric examination, but um, uh, people have found that you know, the, the tests such as uh, tests of orientation, short-term memory tests, they do correspond with MMSE and, you know, those kinds of short, brief inventories to assess cognitive uh, function. Uh, and then the results are later um, reviewed and certified by uh, a municipal committee, including physicians, and, you know, people are given a grade in terms of um, their cognitive functioning, which will uh, enable them to later on access um, various long-term care services like home help, meals on wheels, you know, helpers who come to the homes and so forth. And so um, the uh, outcome for cognitive disability that I'm going to show you for the rest of these uh, slides is on a um, eight-point continuous scale. They've uh, developed a, a symptom scale uh, ranging from one standing for completely cognitively independent no signs or symptoms of uh, dementia, and eight, which is the highest level of um, uh, disability. You're, you're confused, demented, and require specialized in-hospital 24-7 care. So it's, a, it's, it's, like, it's a sort of a rather artificial, but it's an eight-point scale. So just remember that. The higher the uh, points, the more cognitive disability you suffer. So it's not a yes or no uh, kind of diagnosis. It's a sort of a continuous range of cognitive disability symptoms. So the first thing that um, uh, we, we, we noted was that uh, people who, whose homes were damaged um, seem to uh, have uh, a linear increase in their level of cognitive impairment. Uh, and we uh, were able to visit every um, household uh, in the study, send you know, two building inspectors to inspect every home for uh, to, to develop an objective um, scale of disaster damage from uh, no damage, partial damage, minor, major, destroyed. I mean, it's all based on um, these building inspectors who figure out how much of the foundations and uh, other structures have been left intact, and um, they, they give it a, assign it a, a, a numerical scale. And so th these are the results of housing damage with respect to dementia symptomatology, increase in dementia symptomatology comparing before to after. So it's a bit, um, this is a ch the outcome is change in dementia symptomatology 
over the three year period spanning with the disaster in between. Um, and as I said, um, it's an eight point scale. So positive means you know, you, your, your dementia disability progressed that much more, um, 0 0.05 points in the case of partial damage, 0 0.07 points in the case of minor. Neither of these are uh, statistically significant because the lower bound includes the null value. Um, but as we progress to uh, prog you know, more and more major levels of damage, you start to see this almost like a dose response between level of housing damage and dementia symptomatology, and um, th these estimates are significant. To put it into these numbers into context, um, the oldest old person in this cohort, if you're 90 years old in this, in this cohort before the disaster, uh, they progressed on average about 0 0.3 points, 0 0.3 points on the dementia scale over the three year time period. So imagine someone who's like 90 years old, uh, high at risk of uh, you know, uh, losing their cognitive function. And so this is saying that um, if your home was destroyed independent of your age, um, you, your dementia, you know, uh, your cognitive function declined to about roughly the same level as someone who is the oldest old person in the same study. Why? Why is, why is uh, housing damage correlated with cognitive impairment? I mean, it's, it's a marker, actually. Uh, it's a marker, and what it's a marker of is that um, when people's homes were uh, damaged or destroyed, they have to move out. They, they've got to move out of their community. And um, what we you know, heard is that, uh, uh, especially if you're an older person, depending who is dependent on um, socializing with your neighbors to maintain your cognitive function, all of a sudden, if your house is destroyed, then um, you get uh, moved off into a, um, an unfamiliar temporary uh, shelter where you don't know anybody, and you quickly become isolated, and you start to lose cognitive function that much more rapidly. So I, th I think it's a marker uh, of, um, of loss of social uh, connection. And the, way, the reason why it's dose response like that is because obviously the greater the extent of damage, the more likely you are to be evacuated and, uh, and be living in a temporary shelter. This, uh, I took this photo of myself uh, at the field site and this is showing what we call half damage. Uh, namely, you can see the height, you can roughly guess the height of the tsunami here because it came through and swept out the first floor of this house. It is structurally sound, so that um, um, some residents uh, faced with this level of damage, uh, some of them actually chose to stay in these places and just live on the second second floor. Uh, there's no, you know, electricity is likely to be cut off, water, so they, they were you know, living on propane gas burners or something. But then um, if, if you had this kind of damage, you're that much more likely to you know, voluntarily evacuate to a temporary shelter. So I, I think the housing damage is a, is a sort of a good risk marker for people being displaced. And if you're elderly of um, losing connection to your neighbors and friends in your original communities. So um, um, uh, uh, you would recall from, uh, uh, from news reports of this disaster, immediately after the disaster, you know, people who lost their homes, they get herded into uh, emergency, emergency, emergency shelters. Uh, you know, this, this one is uh, from Iwanuma in a local high school gymnasium. Very crowded, stressful living circumstances. Very little privacy. You know, one toilet for you know 30, 40 people. Um, communal cooking. Everyone's you know really, uh, really itching to get out of the situation. And what they're all waiting for is to uh, be eligible to move into one of these trailer homes, they, you know, the converted contain container homes. Uh, they seem very basic, but um, still in most disaster jurisdictions, it, it takes up to eight months for local authorities to get it together to, to, to provide these uh, FEMA style trailer homes to um, evacuees. So every, everyone's in this situation, trying to get into this situation. And um, one of the things that um, we discovered when we were, uh, one of our team members was conducting a qualitative study of um, people in our um, cohort was that um, when they moved from the emergency shelter to um, the temporary homes, 
apparently the city did it in two different ways. Uh, residents were given a choice as to move into the temporary shelter uh, by random lottery or as part of a group. So they said, um, you know, for those people who can't stand uh, living a day longer in the emergency shelter, you can sign up for a, a lottery. And if your lucky, lucky number comes out, then you get resettled in the order in which your number comes up. Of course, that has the effect of speeding up your escape from the emergency shelter, but it also speeds up. It also means that um, by almost by design, it uh, breaks up social connections because you're now going to be settled amongst um, strangers. Whereas other people um, selected to uh, this option, which is I said, nobody in our uh, community is going to move unless we can do it together. So it, that meant um, they had to stay in the shelters that much longer until enough units could be, could, could be provided for everyone to move together. Um, so the downside of that um, strategy is you, you're stuck in the shelters for longer, but the upside is you uh, do get to preserve your social connections that much longer. And we, we, we studied this formally um, in an article published in Science Advances, uh, where we, we took advantage of the fact that we asked about social connectedness before the disaster and afterwards. Right? So we have um, two measures of um, what I call social capital. That is uh, social cohesion and social participation. Cohesion is a, you know, a questionnaire, it's a, a scale that's, that asks people, um, you know, how much uh, do, you, uh, do your neighbors help each other? Uh, how, how much do you trust your neighbors? And um, how attached do you feel with, uh, to, your, to your community? So it's a sort of a cognitive appraisal of how cohesive they think their community is. And then um, the participation is a, is a multi-item scale made up of uh, the extent to which people um, informally socialize with their friends, their neighbors, and they participate in community groups. So remember, we, this is a this is a pre and post uh, difference that I'm summarizing here qualitatively. We showed in the study that those people who uh, relocated by lottery uh, had a, a decline in both both of these both these forms of social capital. Um, uh, this method of relocation uh, speeds up escaping from the shelter, but it destroys social capital. By contrast, uh, those who relocated as a group um, had no change in their reported levels of cohesion, uh, but they even had a slightly increase in participation after they moved into the temporary shelters. This, I think, is a policy implication. And um, when we published this study in uh, Science Advance, uh, it came out in July 2017, which is literally the same month that Hurricane Sandy uh, inundated Houston, actually, and we got called by the Houston mayor's office saying, we just read your study, do you advise us to uh, relocate the residents who were struck by flooding uh, by group relocation? And we said, our answer was, yes, you should. You, know, you should not uh, do the random approach. Actually, when we published this science study, um, a astute reviewer pointed out to us that um, we are just rediscovering uh, old news. Apparently, um, this kind of um, phenomenon has been described uh, some decades before in the United States. I don't know whether anyone's here has heard of the Buffalo Creek disaster. It struck in 19, February 26, 1972. It was a sort of a landslide slash tsunami that happened in West Virginia, in a corner of West Virginia, which is a coal mining town. And this is very reminiscent of the um, dam um, breach in Minas Gerais in Brazil that happened um, last month, right? Uh, remember that uh, mining town had left a whole lot of slag to build up uh, and without disposing of it properly. And one day, this, you know, it just came down in one giant mudslide and buried the whole village. Well, it happened in this coal mining town too because the coal mining company uh, had built these dams, I God knows why, but upstream of this village. And, um, and they just let the slag build up and up and up. And, um, and it was a very unstable structure. And after one heavy rain, it collapsed. And there was literally a tsunami that swept away uh, all of the downstream properties uh, with loss of hundreds of lives. And that's the 
Buffalo Creek disaster. And I didn't know about the study, but for the uh, reviewer's comments, I went and read the uh, book that, that uh, came out of the study of that. It was by the sociologist Eric, uh, Kai Erickson, who uh, interviewed hundreds of residents uh, who were affected by this uh, event. And very interestingly, um, half of the book is devoted to describing uh, what he calls collective trauma. Um, he says, you know, that the main thing that is noticeable that he noticed in his qualitative interviews, because his methodology was ethnographic interviews of, of residents, is what he called loss of communality, which in my translation is uh, loss of social capital. Uh, and the way that happened is that um, the U.S. government placed the survivors into the mobile homes, the, the FEMA trailers, on a first-come, first-serve basis. And as they just scat scattered them randomly um, as they uh, came to seek help. And, uh, and in a quote from the book, um, he points out that most of the survivors found themselves living among strangers. And although they continued to be within commuting range of old friends, they felt alien and alone. Sounds it was exactly like what happened in Iwanuma uh, 40, uh, 50 years later. And in 200, uh, page 214, he describes, these are quotes from the survivors who said, I have you know, good neighbors, it's not the same. The neighbors I had uh, before the flood shared our happiness and our troubles and sorrows. And people said, they, I've not noticed that, that people don't visit each other as they did. Uh, you can drive through the camps and see that most people stay inside with the doors closed. If, you, if you're speaking of an um, aging population, this is the most toxic scenario for um, pushing someone over the edge into dementia, actually. Um, you know, people say, I mean, we even call it the use it or lose it uh, theory of cognitive maintenance, isn't it? It's very important for uh, people who are on the cusp of losing cognitive function to be able to you know, spend time dressing, going out of doors, having a cup of tea with their neighbors. You know, and um, that uh, practice of, of socializing with neighbors is one of the few things that helps people to preserve um, cognitive function. All right, so that's um, um, what we found, uh, the uh, cognitive decline. Uh, now, the, the second finding, the most important factor in, in, uh, in resilience is not material resources, the social capital specifically. Uh, we're interested in whether community social capital can buffer the effect of that kind of dislocation on cognitive decline. Now, um, I'm very interested in social capital because I've long maintained that um, uh, the secret of Japanese longevity is high social capital. It's not the fact that uh, they have uh, you know, eat uh, sushi all the time, you know, tofu. Um, I, I know people like to think that, but as a social epidemiologist, I think the overwhelming evidence is that it's a, a society with high social capital. And um, th there's a reason for that uh, social cohesion um, in Jap rooted in Japanese society. Um, number one, most obviously, they, they maintain over two centuries of um, closed uh, door policy. Remember in the 200 years of the Tokugawa shogunate, um, they executed anyone who stepped you know, foot on the land, didn't they? So it was kind of, they, they kept out all immigrants, and as a result, they became extremely homogeneous, which is still apparent to this day. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but um, it is, you know, it is almost uh, when you have a really homogeneous society, then um, um, that's one basis where people you know, can uh, have developed high levels of, um, of trust and um, uh, mutual regard. They have to, everyone has to survive minding uh, other people. The other reason uh, that Japan has high co uh, cohesion in my view is because it is a rice growing culture. We call it Inasaka Bunka. Um, rice, uh, there have been studies, believe it or not, that suggest that growing rice as opposed to growing wheat um, encourages social cohesion. <clears throat> Why? Because, because if you've ever worked in a rice paddy, uh, my, my grandparents were rice farmers, <laughs> you know, if you're a rice paddy, you have to cooperate with your neighbors because um, you know, rice growing requires a lot of water. I mean, the, the rice plants are flooded half of the year. And uh, that means that uh, everybody has to figure out how to allocate the water amongst the farmers in the village. You recall, you know, Eleanor Ostrom, 
um, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, introducing social capital to economics. Her case studies were based on social capital in rice farms, you know. And um, so it is, it's, it really is a, I think that's the, these two reasons uh, made Japan a rather interesting case in um, studying the effects of social cohesion and social capital. I, I used to argue this purely on the basis of uh, intuition, but someone published a paper <laughs> just last year in JPSB, which is, I understand is the, you know, the New England Journal of Social Psychology is the top of the social psych. And uh, uh, in this uh, paper, a team from Kyoto University used multi-level analysis to um, uh, put to the test whether uh, farming communities are characterized by high cohesion and social participation. So they did a multi-level study. And yes, they do find that the higher the proportion of farmers living in the community, the higher the social cohesion even to this day. And that applies even amongst people who are non-farmers. If you're a non-farmer living in a community surrounded by other farmers, apparently um, you know, people on average express higher levels of, um, um, of social cohesion as well as participation. And when you think about uh, Japanese culture, um, you know, these, these, you know, people say the basis of social cohesion in Japanese society today are the local festivals. Uh, is a bit like the carnival in Brazil, where whole neighborhoods you know, spend the entire year planning for that one event. And these events are all, if you trace their history, they're, they're based, based on harvest festivals, actually, planting festivals or harvest festivals. And so farming, again, is the basis for the strong uh, participation and cohesion in uh, many Japanese localities. So the way, way we measure social capital, as I said, is, is through these two um, subscales, which we have validated. Um, participation is one, one subscale, uh, which is about meeting with friends, informal socializing, uh, participation in um, civic groups of uh, different kinds. And then cohesion is a sort of more perceptual uh, cognitive dimension about the extent to which people say they trust their neighbors, their neighbors help each other, and the extent to which they feel attached to their community. And so these are the two uh, social capital uh, sub-dimensions that we're studying. And in order to answer the question, does community social capital buffer the effect of dislocation on uh, dementia? Uh, we're gonna put it all into a multi-level model. Um, our models have a three-level structure. Uh, at level one is the dement time. You see that um, every individual has two measurements before the disaster and, and afterwards. Actually, we're, we're, we're now up to three um, dimensions and later this year, we'll go up to four. But uh, uh, at the time we wrote the study, we had before and after. So two, two measurements uh, of social cohesion and cognitive uh, function. And um, these two measurements are nested at level two amongst um, individuals in our study. And these individuals are in turn nested in communities. Okay, so it's a three level structure time nested in individuals, nested in communities. There are 99 communities in our study. How do we define community? Well, um, the local uh, city authority did it for us because um, prior to the disaster, they just drew a line and said, you're, you're one cluster, we're gonna call you a community. And, um, and people living there were encouraged to conduct um, disaster preparedness activities like uh, pretending that this is not uh, this is not a picture of an actual uh, afterwards. This is a, a disaster preparedness uh, activity hap that happened before the earthquake, where people are pretending to feed large masses of displa displaced people. But you know, we thought because they were organized in uh, at that le administrative level, that it would be a reasonable definition of a community in our multi-level studies. So on to the results. Um, uh, this gets a bit wonkish, but um, we, in multi-level, we start with a null model, an empty model, where we're just trying to understand variation in the cognitive, um, uh, the outcome here is cognitive disability. Remember on the eight point scale, one to eight, one being fully independent, eight being you know, completely uh, uh, hospitalized, deserving of, of 24 hour care. And uh, in the empty model, we, we, we show uh, what we expect, which is uh, about 6% of variance in cognitive function is at the community level, 43% at the individual level, the remainder uh, soaked up by the time dimension. 
So in model one, we just have individual level uh, predictors of cognitive decline. This 0.05 is simply repeating what I already showed earlier, which is that uh, on a five point scale of housing damage, the, the greater the housing damage, the more uh, your dementia is likely to have progressed. That's what that positive 0.05 means. I already showed you that about 10 slides ago. It is significant. But um, it, in addition to uh, uh, having this variable in the model, social cohesion and participation are protective. So they're protective in the opposite direction. Uh, individuals who say they belong to a, a cohesive uh, neighborhood or they participated with uh, neighbors uh, were significantly less likely to be uh, impacted by cognitive disability um, in this sample. And these are adjusting for you know, quite a, uh, a few covariates that um, you know, obvious uh, could be confounders. Some of them might be mediators. Uh, and then the most um, uh, uh, important model is the last model where we simultaneously uh, include in the model both the individual co uh, social capital but the community social capital as well. What do I mean by community social capital? So in the multi-level uh, analysis, uh, the individual social capital is what we measured at the bottom level, one, two, one, two, one, two. And the community level social capital is the aggregated, aggregated value up to the level of community. So if there are 25 people in community one, we take the average of what they said about the social uh, cohesion and the extent of participation amongst people living in that community. And so, so one is about the individual, the other is about the communities in which people live. And in this multi-level model, what we see is that um, uh, net of individual um, uh, social capital, community cohesion participation are also strongly protective of um, uh, deterioration in cognitive uh, functioning. That's the uh, signature we're looking for. Someone, you know, I said this, you know, someone's had a very bright, bright uh, analogy. They said, oh, that sounds like herd immunity, which it is, you know, uh, because this result is telling us. Uh, I mean, remember, herd immunity is the idea that um, even if you are not, you have not been uh, immunized against um, an infectious disease, so long as enough people around you have been immunized, you will be protected. That's the contextual effect. And um, this is what this, uh, uh, these numbers are showing, is uh, suggesting that net of individual uh, social capital, community social capital is protective. Um, that is, even if you don't personally um, socialize with your neighbors, if enough people in your community socialize before the disaster, you will be protected, that much more protected from developing cognitive um, disability. The last thing we want to answer is can social capital mitigate the impact of dislocation on cognitive decline? That's a, a, that is a what we call a cross-level interaction. Mm -hmm. We need to interact housing damage with community social capital and check for its statistical significance. And the, the uh, interaction terms um, for cohesion is not significant, but for participation, it is. Uh, and so that, that's the answer to that question. You know, does social capital buffer the effect of damage on cognitive disability? And the answer is, yes, it does, in the dimension of social participation. Let me show it in a freehand diagram. This is what it looks like. So we're say, saying that uh, the original finding was that severity of housing damage, which is, I think, is a marker of the loss of your know, social um, connectedness, is positively correlated with cognitive disability over time. Uh, and suppose that that, uh, that uh, line looks like this for people who live in a community with, where people don't participate, socially participate, what uh, the interaction is telling us is that if you're, in a, if you're living in a community with high social participation, that uh, association is buffered. It's buffered. You have, uh, you're protected to some extent by the fact that uh, uh, your neighbors participate with each other and, um, and you're probably benefiting in some ways. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about this concretely, I think it means, for example, that if you live in a community where people connect to each other, um, you know, lots of social connection, even though you might be a kind of a socially isolated type of person, it's likely that your neighbors might come knock on your door and, and uh, encourage you to come out and um, therefore you end up 
participating without, you know, willy-nilly. That would be a, a kind of a herd immunity effect that I'm talking about. All right, so let me talk about metabolic syndrome. This is another thing that um, we, um, I think very few people uh, have noticed. Actually, um, when we did a systematic uh, search, there have been um, one or two other studies uh, in Japan, but it's also after Katrina and so forth, which said uh, there's a problem of uh, increasing obesity among disaster-affected people. But most of them were conducted after the disaster, so we have no way of knowing whether they were already on a trajectory to weight gain before disaster happened. So we are taking advantage now of having information before and after. Okay, so here's what we found. Um, among people who were not displaced, those people who were in the earthquake and tsunami, but the house uh, was not uh, damaged so that they didn't have to relocate, there's no change in their uh, uh, prevalence of uh, probability of being obese. This is pre and post disaster average uh, percentage of uh, obesity. However, uh, among people who were displaced, there's a marked increase, a marked increase in their obesity, which um, there's a huge 10% uh, right, increase in their uh, prevalence, which uh, I, I think you can now say that uh, this is a real phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. So we have some hypotheses of why that is. Um, one is that um, maybe uh, when people moved um, uh, houses, that is they moved from the original location to the, to the new um, location where the uh, trailer homes are set up, that also inadvertently caused the change in the food environment, which led them to uh, eat more you know, fast food, for example, and, and gain weight. Um, this, there's a strand of social epidemiology uh, called contextual neighborhood effects, where we're really interested in studying whether um, local food environment can impact people's weight, right? Uh, and there's been tons of studies that suggest that that might be happening. But the problem is that um, most of these studies uh, have not been able to take account of residential selection. Right? I mean, if you notice that, you know, that people who live close to fast food outlets tend to gain weight, we don't know if that's because you're measuring, you're just you know, tapping into unmeasured preferences, food preferences, uh, or whether you're tapping into you know, the, on the supply side that many fast food outlets tend to open their shops where they think that people will come. Right? So we, we, it's been very, very difficult to establish cause and effect in um, studies of food environment and weight gain. But we're taking, in this study I want to show you, we're taking advantage of a natural experiment because people who moved to uh, the new location were, did so involuntarily. They, they had to move to wherever the city officials offered the um, new uh, container homes. So we're gonna describe this natural experiment of change of food environment and weight gain. The other thing um, Philip mentioned, you know, I've, I've been really trying to think, think of the intersection between behavioral economics and social epidemiology. And one um, uh, uh, psychological hypothesis we have is that housing damage and disaster experience may have heightened present bias amongst uh, survivors. And this led to uh, increased um, snacking, increased alcohol intake, and all these things that lead to weight gain. Let me take this one at a time. So um, we're, we're interested in the Japanese context on um, uh, you know, food environment as measured by distance to the closest uh, calorie rich fast food outlets. And in the Japanese context, these are all the things that I like to eat actually, but uh, the ramen uh, and beef bowl, this is the okonomiyaki, hamburger shop, pizza shop. Uh, and so um, my, my postdoc basically got all of the address, oh, so I got all the address records um, before and after the disaster. And we could find out exactly where all of the bars and fast food outlets and convenience stores were before and after the disaster. Uh, and um, this red hatched area is showing that um, if you live close to the coast, uh, you're more likely to have housing damage and therefore be relocated. And you can see that people whose homes were damaged were rather far from, um, uh, from the fast food outlets. But after the disaster, the city decided to relocate uh, the people marked by the spot X. <laughs> you know, they figured, uh, 
let's move them close to the city center where um, it's, you know, it's convenient to hospitals and clinics, but it also happened to be much closer to uh, fast food outlets. So we have shown, for example, that um, when you measure using uh, GIS road networks, uh, this is a change in percent of residents living within 500 meters of nearest fast food shop. No, no significant difference among people who weren't displaced, but a huge difference, massive difference um, amongst people who were displaced. Uh, Pre-disaster, not many, but then a huge increase as they moved closer to the city center. Same with the change in residents of um, bars. No um, difference between people who weren't displaced, big increase amongst uh, people uh, who were displaced. And so we can take advantage of that to do sort of a, a change on change analysis. You know, does a change in distance to the nearest um, outlet uh, predict a change in BMI? And these odds ratios are significant. They do. Um, so this, uh, you know, is a sort of a spin-off of the study is, is providing a natural experiment on food environment change in relation to BMI. Now the behavior economics part, I have you know, five minutes. Um, so uh, I'm very interested in the behavioral economics concept of scarcity. Um, is a, there is a um, strand of um, emerging strand of behavior economics theory, which says that uh, when people experience any kind of scarcity, it heightens present bias. And uh, present bias in turn is associated with um, all kinds of um, uh, adverse health behaviors, which might explain why they might gain weight. Uh, people may have read uh, the book Scarcity by Mullenleithen and Schaefer, two, two Harvard uh, behavior economists. They, they you know, call it the psychology of poverty. Um, and um, they say, you know, scarcity is a condition that is associated with an uncertain environmental context. If you're poor, you don't know when your next meal is going to come from, um, and uh, that creates uncertainty. And that um, uncertainty imposes a bandwidth tax on our ability to plan for the future. Specifically, people become much more present biased. They develop a kind of tunnel vision. And um, very, you know, the point of this book is that none of us are born that way, uh, and you can induce scarcity, and people rapidly develop that, those set of behavioral responses. Um, classic example would be the marshmallow test, isn't it? You know, you know, so the marshmallow test is measuring um, patients and um, in, the, you know, in a twist on the marshmallow experiment, if you do this experiment with an un, a unreliable experimenter, an experimenter who says, I'm gonna come back you know, in a few minutes and if you wait, I'll give you two marshmallows, but you know, you've already, you can do this so that you randomize the kids to an experimenter who's obviously unreliable. You know, he sort of promises stuff to kids that he doesn't uh, follow through on. If faced with that uncertain context, kids suddenly become much more impatient, much more impatient, much more likely to ring the bell and say, I want to eat the marshmallow right now. Um, now, um, I don't think I have time, unfortunately, to um, talk about the sort of, you know, the, the, the Behavioral economics, you know, modeling of uh, intertemporal choice, as we call it, is the, the classical, um, you know, exponential discount rate um, has this problem, which is that um, it implies uh, dynamically consistent discount rates for people. Um, that you know, if we have one discount rate for, um, you know, the consumption of marshmallow, that the same discount rate applies to all future time periods. You know, there's sort of it assumes a constant rate of marginal substitution, to use um, economic jargon. Uh, and um, that, there's a problem with that exponential model, which behavioral economists have noticed, which is that people do not have constant rate of marginal substitution. We don't apply the same discount rate to all future time periods. Now versus later is not the same as later compared to even later. <laughs> it sounds very odd. But uh, we can do a very simple experiment in this classroom. Oh, there's a you know, seminar room. If I said, you know, which would you choose? Um, if I gave you a scenario, like, like you know, if you come back to this uh, lecture theater next year on this date, uh, you will receive $100. Or um, you can choose to wait a year and one month and receive $120. Given that choice, how many people would um, opt for $100 one year from now? Okay, and how many would wait uh, a year and one month to receive 120? You know, well, thank, thank goodness, right? Because I, I don't know if uh, 
many opportunities where you can get uh, 20% uh, one month you know, premium for waiting one month. But what if I ask the question this way, how about at the end of this, this lecture today, you will receive $100 or you can wait one month and um, if you come back, uh, you will receive 120. If the choice is uh, phrased in that way, how many people would select $100 today? Why? So there's more people doing that. Those people who did that, you just displayed present bias. You know, it's an illustration of present bias. Why? Because both these scenarios involve waiting one month to receive 20, 20 more dollars, right? It's just a one month wait, $20. And so most of you, quite rightly, selected 121 year and one month from now. But the moment um, the choice became you know, now versus a month from now, some of you at least switched to the now option. That's it kind of a feature of irrationality, you know, what we call <laughs> present bias. That's an inconsistent um, time preference based upon, you know, um, the frame. What happens is that uh, um, when, when it's a choice between later and even later, most of us can be quite patient, right? But if it's between now uh, versus later, now versus, oops, now versus later, then suddenly those people switch to the uh, lesser amount. That's just a you know very intuitive understanding of of present bias. Um, it's a bit like um, so. Present bias underlies a lot of our health problems um, in the exponential discount rate. This is showing that the uh, long term uh, valuation is a similar. But if you have present bias choices that are between now compared to later, uh, people become much more impatient, and that problem underlies a lot of health problems, actually. A lot of health behavior. Cigarette, you know, cigarette smoking is a present bias problem uh, in the sense that um, if you ask most um, people who are smoking if they would like to stop smoking, almost 100% will say, yes, I would like to stop, stop smoking. Therefore, um, a smoker's long-term preferences look exactly the same as a non-smoker. They're no different from you or me you know, in terms of saying, in the future, I would like to stop smoking. But if you say to the same per smoking, I mean, per smoker, would you like, okay, since you want to stop smoking, do you want to stop today? Most of them say, no, I don't. You know, that's, that's present bias. It's the choice between now. Versus, so that's where they look different. And present bias, I think, underlies um, a lot of um, health problems, S snacking, drinking too much, um, not being able to stop smoking, and not being able to get to bed on time, not going to the gym. All these are present bias problems, actually. Um, so the other implication is that um, uh, emotions, we uh, specifically the emotion of sadness is also associated with heightened present bias. We've done, you know, I have colleagues in Harvard who've done experiments where we can induce sadness in people who come to the lab and people who feel sad are much more apt to become present bias. You know, you can go through the, some version of the marshmallow test and people will choose the sooner option when they are feeling sad. We call it the sadness trap actually. And that sadness trap um, helps to explain, for example, the very robust correlation between depression and smoking behavior. Every study I've looked at, depressed people smoke at much higher rates compared to non-depressed people. And um, I think part of that is reflecting this kind of sadness trap. Disaster experience is more likely to increase both scarcity and the sadness trap. So they have people who, whose homes were destroyed and they experienced the loss of property, like you know, loss of cars, and uh, at least while they're waiting for the insurance payment to come through, they're likely to uh, be experiencing this present bias. And so our theoretical model is that housing damage uh, not only uh, in, in our case led to an uh, unfortunate change in the local food environment, but combined the scarcity and the sadness trap, they interact to um, lead to more uh, drinking, more snacking, and probably short-term weight gain. So um, in the last part, we uh, have been collaborating with the economist from Tokyo University, Professor Sawada, who has been literally doing experimental economics, bringing people into the uh, these are our um, study subjects, actually. They come. You know, we invite them to come and go through a whole lot of um, marshmallow test type scenarios. We say, would you like to have um, you know, 
receive ten dollars today or wait um, six weeks and receive um, you know, fifteen dollars how about um, waiting uh, three months from now uh, versus three months plus initial four weeks etc right so and in this case uh, when people do, do this experiment we, we give them real money actually <laughs> whatever is they chose we, we give to make it a high stakes uh, situation uh, and there's some gobbledygook which I won't be able to explain all this in the time we have, but the you know, convex time budget methodology alters the um, interest rate, it alters the uh, initial payment um, and the lag, and by altering these three characteristics, we can figure out through re regression what is their uh, beta discount rate. So um, what we're looking for is the signature of present bias, which is uh, in behavior economics of the beta discounting. We're looking for uh, this number, which is to be below one. And you can, what we find is that um, uh, indeed uh, the uh, people who have major damage or destruction of homes have significantly uh, lower beta discount. That's just technical jargon for, that's just, that, that, that is a signature of present bias. People with housing damage do appear to be more present biased, at least at the time when we interviewed them. All right, so my um, the policy implication of you know, present bias is obviously you need to provide uh, financial support for victims. You need to, um, cities you know, should carefully plan where they should locate temporary shelters so that you don't have unintended consequences. And um, one way to overcome present bias is to provide people with commitment devices to help um, recipients of financial aid to save for the future instead of blowing everything on going to the slot machines or you know, going to the bar or other kinds of behavior that tends to be accentuated when um, people are in the throes of present bias. So to summarize, um, dementia and metabolic syndrome are previously underrecognized health problems uh, and social capital can assist in buffering the impact of disaster on that dementia risk. That is our five-year report. <laughs> right, thank you very much.